Hey guys, I'm Peter Hurley and you are listening to the ISO 320 podcast. Shebang! That's right, shebang. This podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Brooklyn PhotoWorks ISO 320 podcast. And today is an incredibly special day because I've got my good friend, Peter Hurley. We met a bunch of years ago and, um, you know, he's just had this kind of meteoric kind of surge in the whole photo world with his headshot, uh, headshot kind of revolution, which I guess is not just about making photos. It's about mentality. It's about psychology. It's about so many things. There's an emotional content. There's a, a physical content. And I guess there's kind of like a special formula that you developed that the world has embraced. I mean, it's funny because I've, I've traveled all over and anytime your name comes up, everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, the squinch. Um, so I'd love to touch on all those kinds of things. Um, I also want to welcome you. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's really a true pleasure and an honor to have you with us. And um, I guess without further ado, let's, let's just jump right into it today. Who, who even wants to hear me talk? People are here to listen to you, my friend. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> right, well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. I was glad you asked. Um, yeah, and I, and I like what you said. I was like, it's just, I never think about it that way. It's not just about taking photos, you know, when you're dealing with people. And it's so important because that's really what the basis of my work is about, is about the person rather than, you know, snapping the shutter, I guess. It's about prepping them, getting them up to that moment when you hit the shutter. And, and uh, it's, it's a process. But yeah, people have embraced it and, it and it works. You know, I mean, the people are making money off the system that I built and I, teach it and I throw it out there and I'm an open book and people are running with it. So it's cool. I think that's the thing that's so incredibly special about what you do is that not only have you kind of pioneered a system, uh, you know, and a good system that, that definitely works, but you've given it away for free. And obviously nobody's going to be Peter Hurley. I mean, somebody that wants to shoot with you wants to shoot with you because of who you are and what you bring personally but the system does work and you've kind of created, I guess, an army, an academy of people out there that are, you know, doing, you know, that have developed like pretty significant careers based on the platform that you've established. And, um, you know, when you first kind of discovered this whole kind of methodology, you know, what was it that, you know, were there a few like specific things that you knew that you had to touch on every time you got, you know, somebody in front of your camera? Um, every time somebody, every time that something like that gets asked, it, my moment goes back to <laughs> this one moment in my career. It, I mean, my brain, my brain goes directly back to this moment. And it, I was up on a roof and I was in a building that I was, um, I had just moved into this building and I had a studio apartment and I had a window and, but I was, I, I wasn't really good at lighting. I had some lights, but I was like, I didn't know what I was doing. So, and I was acting and I had friends that were actors and I, and I was like, I got to figure out how to make money with headshots. So I went into this place that, um, where all the actors reproduced their stuff and they had a bunch of, um, albums there of the photographers that were taking the headshots. And I said to the manager, how do I get, you know, an album in here? And he's like, well, you got to photograph give me, bring me 20 headshots of 20 different people. And if I like them, I'll throw them in an album. You can put it there. So I call, started calling all my friends. And this one friend of mine came over. I was like, I don't know what we're going to do, but let's just go up on the roof. The building was still under construction. So you could access the roof. So I'm up on the roof with her. And I, at that point I had modeled for years. I'd work with amazing photographers. I kind of had an eye. I thought, I thought I knew kind of what I was doing. I thought the light looked good and everything was fine. And I, and I put her in front of the camera and I was like, okay, I have no idea. And it was a friend. So I was like, I have no idea what to say to you or what you should do. So just do stuff. And then she's like, I don't know what to do. I said, well, just do like read a monologue. You have a monologue, start saying your monologue. And uh, that didn't work. And then nothing that I did up there was working. And the pictures 
although technically they look good, I was like, these just, they're, there's just something missing. And that was the moment that I realized this is what it's about. It's about how to direct your subject to get what you want from them. Um, and that was it. And then the rest of my career has been that every day. So I'm all about um, creating new ways to direct people. I think that the direction that I've been given or that I've learned um, is is like these gifts get thrown into my brain and it pops out and I try it with a subject and it works and I'm like, whoa. So the latest thing that I've been doing is more, it's kind of a little bit more on a, my personality's kind of, I guess as I'm aging or whatever, I'm trying to get my personality out of the equation because I have a big personality and I want, I don't think a little person would come into my studio and feel as comfortable if I myself, so I'm playing with my personality with subjects, um, reading them and then, and then doing behavioral stuff now that I never did before. I still have all my old bag of tricks. I have this, this website that you can go to called hurleyisms.com, which is all the crap that I used to say to people, which works. It makes them laugh. It's great. It pulls a lot of stuff out of them, but now I'm just trying to continually, I did that, done that. And I'm trying to continually grow this, this aspect of my, of my craft, which is, is direction. How can you take any human being, um, put them in front of your camera and get the result that you want. So that's what, that's what this is all about. And, and, um, I pride myself on that. I used to want to do consultations with people and meet people beforehand and, and sit down with them and try and get them to chill out and, and they would relax me and relax them. Then I get in front of the camera and everything be great. And then I realized, wait, I'm shooting CEOs and they have like five minutes, right? Like, I don't have time to meet this person. I don't have time to do anything with this person. And they walk in. I seriously, I shot this one CEO and um, it was like a huge deal just getting like through security and getting to the floor and getting, and then they put me in this room and they, it was all like they had to, they didn't have another room with curtains. So they had to block it off with paper and they taped paper to the window. And it was a room <laughs> the size of, it was super tiny on this huge floor of this huge global company with this huge CEO. Right. And jammy in the room and in the middle was a table. I have yeah. this picture somewhere. I took I a picture that. of it. So I put my lights around the table and, and then the, the woman comes in and I, I was like, and I, and, um, I gave her a little bit of direction. I put it in front of my camera. I shoot tethered. I shot four pictures in, 30 seconds or something or less than a minute. And I said, come here, I just want to show you the direction we're going. And I showed it to her and uh, I showed her my laptop and I'm like, this is kind of like where I want you to do this. And she looks at it and she goes, she goes, Oh yeah, that's the best picture I've ever seen of myself. Thank you very much. And she walked out. Wow. And I was like, Oh my gosh, there she goes. And I, I was like this, I was like, is it good? Is it really good enough? It was like a six grand job. I was like, is it good enough? Is it good enough? She's, I was like, okay, it's good. It is good. Okay. Okay. She can go. I mean, it was like crazy. So it's times like that, that you realize that, you know, all the technical has to be done already. They're not right. changing any technical on that job. It's all about your relationship with your subject. And that was it. Wow. You know, it's interesting that you say all that. And I love all of that. And I think that for so many photographers, you know, so many photographers I hear, you know, a lot of guys starting out, women, guys, gals, whatever, um, using that term universally, they always, fig they always are scared of breaking that, you know, human barrier. You know, they, they start off and they're like, hey, how do you connect with your subject? And I think that, you know, what you've done is you've, you've kind of taken it to such a different level, you know, where, where you make your subject feel so at ease and, you know, the, obviously through your personality and all the techniques that you've established, you know, I kind of equate it to, you know, I, I'm, I've been a professional musician and I've worked with tons of different producers, which in, in fact, they're like the photographer, you know, the director, let's say like you are on set. Yeah. And, some producers, you, you literally sit down and you feel like, like you've got a warm blanket on you and you know, you feel like your emotions are, are, are right there and you can just access things and you can be yourself and, and even reach things that you've never reached before. Other producers, for whatever reason, like they make you feel maybe less comfortable, you know, they just want something, they want it now, they're more methodical about it. So a lot of, I guess, what you do is getting people to really, cause look, I've been behind your camera. I remember I was, you know, where was I? I was at maybe one of those photo pluses and you're like, I don't want to get up here. Plus one. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And like literally in like two seconds, like you're getting me, you know, to do stuff and I'm doing all these pictures and it's great and totally comfortable. And there's the confidence, I guess, also working with you with the time that you've put in and the brand that you've established that, you know, maybe people feel less intimidated because how, you know, I'm sure every time or a lot of times, you know, at least I get it, you know, people are like, Oh, I hate having my picture taken or nobody's ever taken a good picture of me. And then you show them like two or three frames and like, Oh my God, that's the best picture anybody's ever taken of me. But I, I remember I watched a Ted talk that you did. There was the, there was like, you guys, you took a word. It was like the psycho, I don't know. Anyway. Psychotology, we called it. It was bridging the self-acceptance gap is what the TED, TED, it's a TEDx talk that I did at MIT. I was pretty psyched about that. Yeah, that was brilliant. And it was very emotional. And I'm sure, so do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I fall apart. I fall apart all the time. Uh, but I, in the end of it, I'm like tearing up and it yeah. was hard to speak. Um, you know, I, I think the moments... I've always had, the, I, I want to delve into this more. Maybe I should be thinking about it during this while we have this downtime, but um, I really feel like, you know, being, you know, obviously being a, alive and on this planet is a gift, but I think a lot of people walk around, you know, at birth, we're given this body, right? And then we have to walk around with it and we, tr you know, travel all over the face of the planet in this body. I was listening to this guy the other day and he, he said, uh, he called it a meat bag. He said, everybody's worried about their meat bag. They're walking around in a big meat bag and they're just worried about it. I was like, oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. <laughs> like to put it to that extent. But the thing is that so many people have this perception of the, of their appearance and there's so many different factors involved in how they feel. And then, and then getting in front of cameras, like ripping the bandaid off that. So some people who are really caught up with their appearance, or maybe they don't like something, or maybe some people go to drastic things to change themselves. Um, some people just, like you said, never had a good picture of themselves. So they don't believe that one is possible. Um, the recipe that I, that I developed, I just tell my photographers that I coach is like, like, if you do the lighting this way, chances are that your average human being has never been in lighting this good. You just get them in there and you press the button and they've already got a better lit picture than they've ever had in their lives. Usually right. unless they've been with a pretty good pro. Right. And, um, and that's why people come in my door, I put them in there and that gives them confidence from the get go. And then you just coach them a little bit and you get something special. Um, but it's, you're dealing with perception. So you don't know what people's, perception is of their of themselves and the moment and I shoot tethered so the very the most critical moment is the moment that they look at themselves on the screen and, and mm. then you ask them like what do you think and when you get the answer I mean I I should record I should just have a, a, a camera on me at all times and only video that moment when I ask them what do you think and then boom for get to the reactions of each human being as they say yeah. that because it, it's, it warms my heart when somebody says, Oh my gosh, I look incredible. I love that. Yeah. Um, this is amazing. Oh, um, I can't believe you did that. I had an actor, one of my favorite stories, I guess I had an actor that, um, people email me and I just keep them in a, whatever in the email, you know, you just load up emails. So, um, like in 2015, this guy emailed me, he was trying to set up a session and then he didn't do it. He never came in or something. And then a couple of years later, like 2018, maybe this is 2018, 2019, like three or four years later, he comes in and he's like, I was trying to set it up, but I couldn't afford it. And he was, he was you know, the actor waiting tables and stuff. And he said, I just didn't do it. And it was three years, it was something like three years ago. And, uh, you know, I've had crappy headshots ever since and, but I got a tax refund and it was the exact amount to pay for this session. So I, I immediately called and I was like, cool. And, and we were talking about it and I was like, and I went back to the emails and I was like, wow, yeah, you did try to schedule. This is amazing. I'm glad you're back. Let's do this. Get in front of my camera. And I've been doing this thing. I used to do this thing where I would take the picture of the person before I directed them. So they would just be vacant looking and kind of out of place and just look uncomfortable. And then later in the session, I'd be like, see, see where we went, see where you were here. And then we started working and now you're like this. And I was like, why do I do that? I did that because I felt I needed, you know, to show them something like that. Mm. And then I was like, no, I started doing this thing called a one shot deal 
and I it started on the trade show floors because I was a bunch of people wanted me to shoot them. I said, "All right, I'll give you one shot. I'm gonna take the one frame of you. It's a one shot deal. Let's go." So I direct them towards. I hit it once, and that would be the picture they would get. So I just decided to do this with all my clients. So I don't take a picture before I really think it's really really good. Uh, and I did it with him, and I took the picture. And normally. If I, if I really like that picture, sometimes I'll bring them out and I'll say, hey, look at that. Or they can see the tether um, around the lights. They can't see it directly. They've got to look around. So sometimes I'll say, hey, look around the lights and look at that. And um, let me know what you think. Or in this case, I, I took the picture and I was like, come here. I want to show you something. And I brought him around and he looked at it. And I said, what do you think? And he looked at me and he was crying. Oh. Um, he said, I wasted three years of shitty headshots and I could have had that in one picture. And, uh, and that was an amazing moment for me. So, and it happens, you know, and then you get the, the other extreme where they're like, Oh, Oh my gosh, I can't look at that. What is this is a piece of garbage. Like I can't, I look terrible. I was like, and it's, so now they're talking about themselves. Like it's my work. Right. I was like, are they talking about my work or are they talking about them? Like, I know, you know, I'm like, I get confused. And I've had it at all levels. I had Miss Universe. I've shot a couple Miss Universes, and we, I um, talk about this with them. I mentioned Miss Universe in the 10X talk, the one who said this, and I mentioned this story. She looked at herself, and she said she, her husband was across the room while I was doing the edit with her, and she said, honey, I can't stand my face. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So the psychologist that I was working with Anna Rowley um, said in the TEDx talk, I believe she said this in there, um, which I think she did. I think she does. I have to watch it. I haven't watched it in so long uh, that we live in a fault based society. So we're, we're conditioned to see our faults first. So we just Great. let that's it. And people conjure up the, I call them perceived flaws because they're not flaws to other people. They're flaws to you. You know, everybody's, you know, we're saddled with this at birth. So uh, some people feel they got a raw deal some people feel they got a great deal you know and and how we walk through life i think it's part of our plight is to is to see how we deal with it so and with as photographers we're we're the ones confronting these people i i always i had a photographer tell me once he goes you're not you're not just a photographer he said you're a personal brand manager and i was like basically yeah i mean i i am so my my thing about people coming in is not only to give i i have this quote where i say um, the photo is simply a byproduct of the experience that we had an opportunity to give somebody in front of our camera. So they're going to remit, they're going to have the photo as whatever they came in for, but the experience they'll leave with. So my thing is to put a skip in their step, make them feel better about their appearance so that they can walk around the planet earth feeling better about uh, like their, how they, how the world sees them. Uh, and it's tough. And that's really like one of my, you know, um, purposes for this whole thing so if if i don't cre if that doesn't happen on a session it causes this tension in me and it, it messes with my day and i'm like you can't mess with my day this is my day too like you have to right. like these pictures whether you like it or not you know it's tough <laughs> anyway it's a process you know it's interesting i um one thing that i've come to try to work on with a lot of people is what you were touching on earlier is i try to say like you know they're like oh i don't like my mouth and my my nose is weird and my eyes are lopsided. And I'm like, what do you like? Focus on the one or two things that you do like about yourself. Let's start there. Let's stop focusing on the 10 things you don't like. Let's pick one thing maybe that you do like. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, well, you know, I, I really do like this dimple. And I'm like, all right, so let's, let's get that going. And, you know, to get them to kind of like, it's like, it's like redirecting with like a dog that's like, you know, focused on another dog and wants to kill it. It's like you kind of give it something else to think about or look at. And I think that that's... So I'm, go ahead. I love that. I'm just writing it down in my notes. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay, I'm going to use that. Oh, I love that. That's, that's amazing. Awesome. It, it, I, never, it, I never went there with that. Well, what do you like? You know, that's a great question. Just to try to flip it around. You know, my wife is so... She's so good at that. Like that's how she always sees that side of things. You know, I'm so much more of like the cynicist and like, you know, she's always like looking at the one good thing that's always sitting right in front of you. And you're like, ah, oh, of course it's right there. Come on. Thank you. Um, but one of the things that I also 
that we've touched on in these conversations and that you bring to light without even thinking about it is the minute you get in front of your camera, you get, you know, you walk onto your set, you're, you're performing, you know, look, you obviously were trained as, a, as an actor, you were trained as a model. So you knew that the minute you, you, you jumped in front of whatever it was, the camera, the casting director, you were performing. And that performance is something that I think that you've done an incredible job of bringing into your photography. And by having your lighting dialed in so perfectly, um, and obviously your camera settings and your tether, the whole thing, the whole thing's just like literally like ready to go for somebody to stand there. You go click and that first shot, you know, is better than probably most anything that they've gotten previously. That level of performance, I think also enables your confidence on set and, and enables you to be able to bring these amazing things out of people um, and, and take this, thing that you've built to such another, you know, to, to a whole new level. Um, I didn't realize, sure. that you, I didn't realize you were trained as an actor, but it obviously makes so much sense <laughs> now that I, now that I hear that. Well, I, you know what I think the other thing is, is that the confidence that a photographer, all my coaching is based on having a photographer be more confident behind their camera because it, it's contagious. Yeah. It'll, drizzle off onto your subject it like it's like amazing and it's it's fun to watch i mean when you i mean i i've had people come in the studio and behave you know you see them you meet them they're cool maybe they go into makeup and they and they're all made up and they're ready to go you put them in an outfit and they get in front of the camera and all of a sudden they're like stiff and their personality just evaporates from their body <laughs> And they get less attractive. That's the problem is that when that happens, people become less attractive. So now you're like, oh my gosh, now I've got a, there, that's a completely different person that I'm dealing with. But what I found was that as you, as you gain the, the, you know, their trust and they get more confident, they get more attractive. Like it's, it's just, it just happens. So they, I'll be, I'll be shooting somebody and, you know, I feel for me, it's I'm failing for the first half hour of the session, but I'm trying to get through it because I know if I can get a couple good shots and get them on a roll, they're going to let drop all that. And it's like a switch is going to go off and all of a sudden we become more attractive. So that's why I always try and capture uh, expressions that are subconsciously driven. Uh, because what happens is, is that we don't, we don't walk around controlling our expressions. We don't have time for that. There's way too much on our plate. Could you imagine walking down the street and being like, okay, I should smile at this person. Let me pull my, the corners of my mouth up or let me jack my eyebrows up right now. I mean, we don't do that as humans. So the only time we ever do that is in front of a camera. So you get in front of a camera. Now you think about your face. You put your attention on it. You try and consciously control something and you're a novice at it because you never do it. I think the only times you do it are in front of a mirror and in front of a camera and in front of the camera, you can't see yourself. So people get weird. And then what, so what I did and the basis of the biggest, the biggest hurdles I've jumped over in my direct or in my direction and in in learning this stuff is when I get the person to forget about the camera and they become themselves. And then I pull the, these expressions out that are the way that they would behave if the camera wasn't there. And that's the trick for me. Um, so it's interesting back to re real quick, back to the, I just wanted to say a couple other things about the, about the fault based society. I, I always say this. I know I wonder where it started to happen because I never had a 10 year old walk in here and go, Peter, you know, these are great, but I should have lost the 10 pounds before I walked in, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. And I never had anybody walk in and, and say, uh, you know, Peter, this is your lucky day. My skin is flawless. My hair is perfect. I got enough sleep. My, it's just, my skin is radiant. This is going to be so easy on you. You know, it's always like, oh my gosh, I couldn't get over here. The cab, I'm late. It's raining. My hair's like a mess from the humidity. And I got to Like, it's all of that. Um, but the, the thing that gets me is that everybody, even though they're saying that stuff, they still want you to be to be your best like they're like i never point the camera at somebody and try to dumb down my ability to take a photograph you know i never had anybody come back in here and say peter you know what you don't need to do that great pull back on the throttle i know you're really good but for me you don't need to don't you don't need to use all your juice on me it's no problem <laughs> you know it's like 
everybody wants the best picture of themselves. Right. And every photographer out there wants to take the best picture they can. We're both on the same page there, but these things get in the way and we have to clear them out. I, I shoot a lot of, uh, I shoot a lot of weddings. And so it's in a, almost the opposite kind of a, of a studio situation. And what I, the feedback I get a lot and I don't do it intentionally, but when I see something that I love, the frames, just the, I'm not even looking at the back of the screen, just the light, whatever it may be, I get super excited and they feed off of that excitement. And there's nothing more uncomfortable usually than a bride, uh, more so than a groom, but a groom as well, you know, they could feel so uncomfortable in the beginning. And when they feed off of your excitement and I don't I don't intentionally, uh, I don't fake excitement. I don't intentionally do it, but, um, but when it happens and maybe now I'll kind of intentionally do it <laughs> after uh, <laughs> hearing from you, but, um, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's infectious and it just makes it, and they get so excited and it, you know, you show them a picture of themselves and they look beautiful. And, but even without showing the picture, just seeing the photographer's reaction to what he's taking or she's taking, um, is you know something i haven't really thought much about until now it's huge i'm glad you brought it up it's huge because i i you know i i do this workshop called the headshot intensive where i teach what i do and uh it was a two-day workshop and then one day the class was like can we stay tomorrow and i was like what am i gonna do with you tomorrow kidding me three days so i actually added a third day and on the third day they photographed me and what i found was when i'm in front of somebody's camera that's not excited or not giving me feedback and telling me how i'm doing right or has any excitement about the pictures that i'm just like bored out of my mind and i'm like all right let's get this over with so you as the photographer create the energy there has to be an energy between you and your subject for anything to leap into your lens and get excited about anything. Like I like what you said, like they could, it could be the, you know, 90 degrees outside and you're shooting a wedding and everybody's sweaty and wants to get back into the reset or whatever's going on. And it's just a mess and you're a mess and you've been shooting all day, but that light is unbelievable out right. there. So you're freaking out about the light. Just freak out about whatever it is mm-hmm. that excites you. And you, you know, you don't even have to verbalize, just act like you're, you know, and that's the one thing. So you don't but, have to. Sh- but there's also that, I find that there's this, such a fine line between that, um, the terrible sayings that you hear other photographers say and, and, and how they try, <laughs> and it makes my, you know, I see other photographers and uh, it makes my skin crawl. We and it almost makes me like in the pictures because one, two, too. three, and it almost makes me like <laughs> re- revert backwards. Like I, I, I have to actively not do that. And I always try to, you know, for what I do, see what they do first and then sort of base it. You know, I have a little more time than, than, you know, uh, in a studio setting, but just the thought of that, you know, 19, whatever it may be it's not even 1960s 1970s but it's just like those sayings that that are like ingrained in your brain even though i've i've only you know i haven't been around and i haven't been in front of the camera to experience it it just makes my skin crawl yeah and you have to, and you have to be uh, very careful it, with it's a shtick you know so yeah. they're that's all they got if they had other stuff then they wouldn't uh have to use that stuff i always tell people because a lot of people there's photographers out there that like you know the creating laughter for as a a skill the skill of creating laughter genuine laughter in a subject Mm -hmm. for a headshot photographer or any photographer any portrait photographer that skill is a huge asset uh at any moment uh being able to do that so photographers you know it's it's been you know, since the beginning, say cheese or whatever the hell they, you know, they're trying to do this, whatever the saying. My one and a half year old daughter says cheese, you know, it's. Yeah. Uh, my goal's always, always been to get rid of all of that. But, but the, the thing is, is that the photographer doesn't have any other, any other thing. I call it a director's toolbox and their toolbox is filled with crap and they're not working on mm-hmm. their shtick well mm-hmm. enough to have something that's, that's genuine. You know, and sometimes it meshes with their personality and they get the results. So, you know, do we care how maybe they don't care the way they, you know, they pull it off, just that they actually got the shots. And 
if they're making money and that's the way they're running their business, then that's fine. But on a daily basis, I want to, I want, I'm constantly con trying to grow. So if you're saying the same thing that, I mean, I say, I, I based all my work off repetition. I'm not going to say, I don't say the same thing every day. Uh, but there has to be, I, I used to have when I started and this is how I, I learned this. Um, I used to have a shtick that was so built in that I did everything the same during the session, everything flowed exactly the same way. I had a whole uh, thing and my, and my sessions for actors lasted like an hour to an hour and a half. I don't like to say the same thing twice. So it was really long and it was <laughs> detailed. And when somebody didn't do something that, that I thought would work, I would have to skip that. So some people were terrible and I'd be skipping all the way to the end of my shtick by the first 15 minutes. And I'd be like, and then I'd be out of it. And I, I remember like, what am I going to do? And since I was shooting a lot of actors, it was actors. So then I got this uh, corporate guy came in and said, I need a corporate headshot. I'd never done one up to that point in my career, really. And I was like, do the things that I did with actors is like, I'd put them in scenes and I'd use my acting chops and I would do all this stuff. And I was like, well, I can't do that with him. So I started saying, turn to the left, smile, chin down, forehead out, turn to the right, you know, and I was like, I've got nothing for this guy. And that was another epiphany that I was like, okay, I need to develop something that works for everybody. So every photographer out there, if they're not constantly working on that, every time they, they are actively shooting, they're not playing the game for me. If they're, if they want to be a portrait photographer or anyone. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I think that what you described is so common. Like I remember, you know, my first, you know, kind of big, portrait sessions like that and I remember I had to sh you know shoot like I was doing like some fashion stuff and you know that was different because the people in that world were kind of like they were young and loose and like you know kind of more malleable and then they were like you know well well while you're here you know we need a shot of the CEO and I was like whoop <laughs> you know and I remember like going up to the executive floor which was like all marble with a private elevator and like the dude had like an office that was like bigger than any New York City apartment I'd ever been in and it was pretty frightening but um you know it it, it took me a while to kind of realize how to handle and manage CEOs and the funny thing about CEOs is that they want direction maybe more than anybody because they're, they're just, they're, it's so out of their comfort zone. You know, they don't, they're not going to sit there and like, you know, get into this big emotional connection. They're going to give you a handful of minutes. They, they want direction. They want you to be confident and say, you know, give them the purpose, you know, for, for which you're doing things. Like, it's like, here's my business plan for today's shoot. But, um, you know, I really do try to connect with, with, with those folks and, 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 you know, going from where I was in the beginning shooting CEOs to where I am now, it's like such a, such a different process. So it's interesting to hear how you almost had a scripted version of how you did things. And there was this progression, like an arc, you know, like your performance was like, okay, you know, we're going to start here and then we're going to put in this bit and then we're going to get to this bit and then the grand finale and everybody's happy and we hug and we go home. And having that kind of disrupted, you know, threw off your game and you obviously yeah. adapted. But, um, and I wrote it down somewhere. I had it written down. Oh my God. Everything I did. And I think I put parts of it in my, in the book I wrote, I wrote this book called the headshot and I put parts of it in there. There's stuff in there that I don't do at all now. Right. That is in the book, but it was part of my shtick back then. So what I, what I found was as you get better at this and as you, it becomes, um, things become more clear. I like to say when I'm coaching people, imagine um, you're in a car and you, you just ran out to your car on a, on a whatever, a dewy morning and the sun's rising up and your car is all fogged in and you open the car and you get in and you turn on the defrost and that little section just opens up for you. And you can see through it and maybe it's snowing and maybe it's frost, you know, so you're trying to defrost the car. And what happens is, is as you grow as a photographer, the frost just starts to become, maybe you're technical. So you've you got this little area and then it starts to go. And then eventually you have peripheral vision and everything's clear. And that's what happened with my career. It was like, wait a minute, I'm starting to get more clear. And now that everything's opening up for me so that I, I, I really, the only, the thing that I say to people about the way I am now and the way I was throughout my career is that my attention to detail has gone through the roof. Like I see everything at once and then it allows me to 
concentrate on that person. And then, and then my brain flips into this mode of, um, like playfulness with myself. It's like a challenge for myself. It happened with me when I go on stage and speak as well. I used to be petrified of stages and now I go up on stage and I'm like, okay, let's figure out how to really screw this up and mess around with these people and see what we can do. It's the same on the, on the, in my sessions where I'm so, if, if I, if I'm feeling particularly confident that day, um, I'll, I'll dig into the person and, and do different things just to try it. And the best people to do it with are the people that are amazing in front of the kid, the people that you're having the best time with the people that don't care about their face or their appearance. They just get in front of the camera and they're just loving it from the get go is where I think the nuggets are given to you because that's where you're both on a creative plane and the energy is going between the two of you. And that's where you can really try different, different things that, you know, you've never tried before. Um, I, I mean, things that popped into my head over the years that, um, like it's little things too. It's like the, it could be, uh, it doesn't even have to be uh, verbal. Like I'll do things with my body that I never, that people are like, like I'll just do something like, oh wait, hold on. I got this. Let me see if I can get this right. Hold on. All right. Okay. Stay right there. Stay right. And I'll just move in a weird way. And they'll be like, what are you doing? Here? I was like, I don't know. I was just trying to, to see how you react to me. Or, uh, you know, anything. It's like uh, anything's fair game. So uh, one time, and I used to have my assistant, right? We'd open a Google Doc, which auto saves everything because I don't, and, and uh, anything I said, my assistant would write down. So I've got all these docs of all this crap that I said over the years. So, and when I say something really good, I freak out because I know I'm going to use it like for the rest of my career. So I said to this, um, I said, I was shooting this guy and I was like, can you, do me a favor. And, and he's like, what? I was like, can you look slightly more handsome right now for me? It's just going to make my job easier. <laughs> and was like, like just, and I just was like, I could say that every day uh, for the rest of my career to somebody and, and it would garner some sort of reaction. It's going to get me something, you know, right. uh, with the women, I just go add a touch of beauty to that right now. This is a great shot. Can you add just a hint, just layer some beauty in and they just, you know, it's just, and if it creates that laughter, then I got it. It's amazing. What I found was I use laughter a lot. Um, not necessarily. I mean, most corporate types don't even want to show their teeth, but uh, I do it because if somebody's laughing, they're having a good time on the on the set. They're just they're, they're, they just are, and the laughter shots are for their family or whatever. But the thing is, is that the I I talk about this. I teach this too. When we smile or when we crack up we're tensing all the muscles in our face they're contracting right so when people come off those smiles they're the most relaxed they're going to be and their muscles are the most relaxed and then you get the serious shot that rocks because they're not they, they don't have time to think oh i'm in front of the camera again i just cracked up about something and then it just slowly uh and that's where i think i'm getting most of my good shots so i will always work in um some sort of humor or just having a good time or something like that you know when i'm working Awesome. Yeah. And, and I think it's also the way that you're working in the humor is that you're collaborating with your subject. So you're getting your subject to kind of react and, and, and that you're not laughing nervously. Um, it, so much of what I think makes a shoot effective is the confidence that you bring and then instill into your subject and the subject feeds off of that. And I've had subjects and I'm sure you've had this too, where you know, they come in and they're so wound up and they're so worked up and they've had the shittiest day and a horrible commute and they, you know, like they're bloated and all the other stuff and their hair is crazy and they're so tense and so anxious that it's, it's, it's easy to feed off of that as the photographer. And the hard part is to be able to say, oh, no, no, no. And, and be able to take your good energy and your good vibe and your humor and then kind of encapsulate them with that. Put that blanket on them and just say, it's okay. It's going to be fine. Right now, nothing else matters. You and I are the only people in this world, you know, and, and this is a safe place and we're going to have fun with it. And 
it was, you know, look, I wasn't able to do that when I first started doing headshots and, and portraits of people. I was also scared. If somebody came in and they were scared, all of a sudden that scared the shit out of me. And then you had two anxious people <laughs> running around and like, then I would forget my lighting and everything would just completely go to shit. <laughs> yeah. So it's I, interesting. I, yeah. I was the same way. I mean, I think we all go through that. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. You, you have a great way of articulating it though. You know, you, you, you put to words, I think what so many of us think and go through. And one of the things that you touched on that, that we've talked about in other episodes is the growth. And that I think one of the reasons why all of us pursue photography is because it's a constant pursuit. You know, it's not something like you just are like, okay, I've arrived. I've, I've, I'm at the best I'll ever be at this thing. And I don't want to learn a thing more, or try anything. I think that the idea that we can constantly grow and push ourselves and make breakthroughs, taking things that we've built and kind of layering them, them in there, but always moving forward um, is, is, is interesting. And it's great to hear too, you know, about how, you know, you've progressed because people see you as like, you know, Peter Hurley, the headshot master but you're human, you know, you started somewhere. I always tell people I've, I've, um, I've never taken a perfect headshot, so I'm still not there as far as right. I'm concerned, you know, it's like, I've how does, uh, how does, uh, how do lenses and, and cameras actually affect your, your involvement, your, um, the way you've evolved over the years and it does it play a role or is it just, uh, you know, yeah, it changes the the workflow and the and the the technique. I mean, the way that I shoot. I mean, I'm fifty now. Jeez, whoa! <laughs> said that since I turned fifty. I turned fifty in February, so I'm like, I like it just hit me that I I don't think I've said that I'm fifty in a while in a in a couple months since or whatever since February. Um, but I I was like, you know, the eyes are going, then the glasses came on. So I used to shoot medium format and manual focus for the whole beginning of my career. And then, and I never even owned or shot a DSLR. And then I got a DSLR and I was like, Whoa, wait a minute. This thing focuses really fast. <laughs> this is like amazing. <laughs> and then I was like, this is pretty cool. But then I was, you know, I was recomp I was doing one focus point and recomposing it. So I was recomposing every single shot. And then Canon put an EOS R in my hands and they said, oh, yeah, and you just put this here and it focuses on the person's eye. And I was like, what? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Are you serious? Yeah, it's like easy mode. Crazy. So now I don't have to recompose. Like, it's changing things. So um, it's funny. you actually have to do less on set. It's funny to see. Yeah, it's funny to see how I think I shoot, I think – well, when I started, I was shooting medium format. So I had, I was shooting a contact 645. What is that? 16 oh. frames for a roll of 120. Yeah. 16. Yeah. 16. So you got 16 frames of roll of film. You're taking your time. Like you're, and I've got a Pentax six, seven, which is 10 frames. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I was like, I'm taking my time. You know, you go digital and then you can go hog wild crazy. Um, and I think the thing about, the medium format when I first got it is it's a there's it was like a second and a half between shots back then you know so it was like it still wasn't fast you're still I still re, a second and a half I'm recomposing I'm refocusing I'm doing everything and then I'm shooting in so I think so now I've got I I'd never put it on uh burst mode or anything or I always single frame when when I shoot but um I'm still able to shoot really fast and uh, I just don't like, I, I edit uh, with my clients now and, it, and uh, we actually, I developed this uh, new, I didn't develop it, my friend developed this system of sell, selling images and he wanted me to do it. His name is Tony Tafe and I was like, I was like, I'm not, I've been doing it the same way since forever, for 20 years, I'm not gonna change my system now. And basically what I would do is I would shoot, I'd charge a session fee. So, you know, basically my, my, I call it my mini session is a thousand bucks. You get in front of my camera, it's a thousand bucks. Um, and you leave and you go to the retoucher and you pay the retoucher, whatever the retouching cost is. I don't get a dime from the retoucher and you're gone and it's a thousand bucks to me. That's it. And he's like, don't do that. And I would give them the entire shoot. So whatever I shot, 
that I wanted to keep. I, I would call it down. Like I do the edit to get rid of all the crap, but um, I'd give them the, the entire shoot. And he's like, no, don't do that. He's like, you got to do it my way. And I was like, I'm not going to switch this. And then in August of last year, I was slow. And I was like, it's kind of slow. All right, I'll try it. I'm going to mix it up. And what he does is he does the culling and the editing with the client and he edits down and then he only lets them take the ones that they want to purchase. So he said, now you set the purchase price, you sell them and then you can outsource the retouching. So I outsource to my assistant who's retouching them. And uh, I charge a hundred bucks an image and I shoot slower and, and more methodically because I know that there's potential. Now I'm with them. I'm, uh, it's like I used to do a consultant fee for 300 bucks after the, they could come back in and, or we could do it over zoom or whatever. And they can look, we can look through the images and we can, we can decide together on which images we, we like best. And I would charge yeah. them for that. But now I'll shoot and I get excited about shooting because now I've shot, you know, the last session I did before uh, the coronavirus <laughs> um, was a portrait session. So it was a $3,000 session and the guy, my portrait sessions are three grand for them to walk in the door. And then he bought 33 images. So I made 6,300 bucks. I still have to pay my retoucher, but before I had this system, it's called the TNT method. And uh, we, I actually did a tutorial with the guy. So if you go to that headshotcrew.com forward slash tutorials, you could see it there. But um, I did, I developed the system based on what he told me to do. And I, and I watched the thing and I'm still learning it, but um, you know, before I would have made 3000, that would have been it. And any retouching cash would have gone straight to my retoucher. Now I've got $3,300 extra and then I pay my retoucher from that. So it's amazing. It, are it's you, amazing. are you, when you say you're selling the images, are you giving them like full copyright? Like they can do whatever they want with it? No, I don't give copyright. And most of it's just for personal branding purposes. Like if they're going to use it commercially, they've got to pay a licensing. So like if like Forbes <laughs> called them up or variety and wanted to run it, they would have to pay you a licensing fee. So the hundred dollars, if it's a magazine, it's okay. If they're going to put it on a book or something, then I'm going right. to charge them a licensing fee. Or if billboard. They're going to sell it. Yeah. In a magazine, it's fine. It doesn't bother me. But is there wow. like a flat fee? Like, like when they walk in there, they have to pay some sort of fee to, just for the basic shoot and then pay yeah, for the images? It's a thousand dollars flat okay. to walk in my door for what I call my mini, mini session, which is a half hour shooting. Uh, it's $2,000 for a full headshot session, which is like, it's basically an hour and a half of shooting. And then my portrait session is just, a, it's longer and I do headshots within it and, and also portraits and that's 3000. And then they pay a hundred bucks an image that, that for whatever images they want to keep. And those are all the images I keep. Like I don't show them anything else. So they, they purchase them that day and we go through it and that's that. Nice. I've actually taken to a similar kind of a thing with um, the portrait sessions that I do where we, um, you know, I shoot tethered like you, um, which kind of has driven my camera choice, unfortunately, in some ways. And I say unfortunately, because I haven't found a, an SLR, like even though I'm doing the mirror list and with the IAF and all the other bells and whistles that kind of really make it easier on us, I'm, I'm not in love with, with the rig that I have right now for that purpose. Um, but um, I'm doing the same thing where like the client, you know, as soon as I finish their session, and even if I'm shooting like 10 people that day, we sit down, they make all their selects. Those are the only ones that, that they're getting, you know, the retouching I'm also keeping in house. So, you know, I have a deal, you know, I have a retoucher that I use, but they pay me and then I pay my retoucher. So it's interesting. And that's, that's something I started instituting only like a year or so ago as well. So, you know, it, it, it gives me more control, puts a little more money on the table. But, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, I think it's a better, better way to go. You know, is it, why should you give it away? Why should you leave money on the table? Um, so, yeah. yeah that, that's, I mean, it's just been better. It, it's made me a better shoot. It's made me more into it and more into creating quality imagery that they will purchase at the end of the session. That's, that's it. It's better for them. It's better for me. Uh, it's more engaging for the photographer. You know, it's like, I'm trying different stuff, different lighting, yeah. different backgrounds. I'm trying to give them variety. Um, I'm enjoying it more. It's, it's and you're great. using a lot of the, um, you have this whole uh, LED light panel kind of 
thing that you kind of encapsulate your subject in in a bath of beautiful light. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, look, it's a signature look. I mean, it's very easy, you know, like my sister's an actor and, you know, she's got all these actor friends and like, you know, I, you know, you know it's very easy when you see somebody that's got a Peter Hurley headshot, you know, or, you know, or somebody who's trying to copy you, but there's, there's, there's definitely a lot a, out there now. So it's hard. Yeah. It's sometimes hard to tell. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or not. yeah, but uh, I like. I mean, it's a cool look, you know, it's, it, it, and it, it certainly is flattering um, for a lot of people, you know, whether you take it into like the super kind of bright white look or the, the, the more moody, darker look. Um, but I'm sure that that also eliminates a lot of the, you know, having your lighting so dialed in means that you can literally just start working the minute somebody pops into your, into your life or whether you're going to their place, you just set it up and you know that you can have those predictable results, at least with the lighting. Yeah. So you only work on the, on the person and the personality. What, do, what do you, um, I mean, I'm sure you've had it happen. But like what happens I mean, have you had people that literally just, you can't break that there's just, they're just flat. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I always say usually humans have the capacity to learn. Uh, some people just don't seem to. So, <laughs> uh, as I'm coaching, they should get better. But I mean, I, I, I had this one guy, I'm just a stickler for my, like if they're going to, it's going to put, it's, it's going to have my stamp of approval on right. it. Got to, you know, I've got to get it. So I, and I go above and beyond when I have to. I had this one guy that just like it took me like an hour to warm him up and then I got a couple shots and then he just went but every time he changed and got back in front of the camera it was like we were starting at square one again. It would mm -hmm. take another hour and I think my I mean I just ended up shooting him for like five hours something stupid to get like five pictures that I liked. Isn't that um, funny how you work so much harder with somebody that gives you nothing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. you start feeling like the, the 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 sweat you know start to like gather in your armpits and <laughs> yeah. flushed feeling because you're like oh it's not working funny he came back years later and he was like oh my gosh those were amazing and <laughs> and he it was actually got better i was like all right well so you learned something while you were away if i for fun yeah. got better you can whatever it's it was. okay it's okay yeah, i've been trying to hold back oh yeah um so how are you doing, man? You were, you were, you were, you were sick for a while and kind of quarantining and how did that go? And did you get tested and do you want to talk about it? Sure. Yeah, I got tested. Um, I went to, so while all this was going on, fortunately, I just, I have the shirt on. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, Headshot Mania 2 hmm. was uh, my conference and I do it biannually. So we did it in 2018 and 2020 will be maybe do it in 2022 i don't know right <laughs> who knows uh what's going on with that kind of stuff but it was in vegas in february so um luckily we got through it and i finished up came back home and immediately was supposed to go off to uh australia to do a couple workshops and i raced sailboats so uh i had a world championship down there that i was going to sail in and everything. So I was going, I bought a new boat. It was in Australia already. I'm like, I'm going to Australia. And my wife's, this stuff starts to happen. And I was supposed to leave March 10th. And my wife's like, you should not, this is all going on. Like, you sure you want to go? I was like, ah, I'm going, I got to go. And I jump on the plane, I get down there. And I remember not feeling great. I was okay, but I was a little stuffed up. And then they canceled the world championship, but they had a little regatta before it the national championship and they decided to keep that one going. So I was like, let me sail for a couple of days and see how I feel. Meanwhile, the other Americans were jumping on planes and leaving. Uh, my buddy was a pilot for United. Like he flew in with me and then he stayed like one day and he's like, I'm going to go tomorrow. I was like, just stay another day. Like, come on, don't leave me hanging down here alone. And he flew back. Um, and finally I was like, wait a minute, the world championship canceled. And then, and then Trump closed down flights from, from Europe. Um, and that was the day I was like, oh boy, I better get home because if I get stuck in Australia, um, you know, I have friends that are stuck in different places in, in the, in the world right now and they can't get back home. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad. So I jumped on the plane, I threw a mask on and the plane from, from Melbourne to San Francisco was packed. There wasn't a seat on it. And the woman next to me was like coughing the entire 
time. Oh my god! Like, oh geez, <laughs> not bad, but enough that I was like constant throughout the flight. And then we got off the flight. I'm in line behind her, waiting to go through customs, and she's coming. I was like, "This not." But I had my mask on the whole time. I was like, "I hope I'm okay." So I get off that flight. I get on the next flight from San Francisco to to Newark, and uh, empty. Nobody, like I had the whole economy plus was like, there were 10 people in the whole thing, the whole economy plus area. And it was a huge plane. I was like, this is crazy. I had nobody near me. And um, every, they recommended quarantining for two weeks. So my mother-in-law lives with me. She's 76 and she's frail. So I, I was concerned for her. Um, and I was like, I'm not bringing this into my apartment and having that potentially happen. So the studio's three minute a three minute walk from my apartment and I've got a couch uh, and a bathroom, but no shower. So I was like, I was like, I could do this. So, and my wife would uh, cook for me and leave, leave the food in the hallway. So I'd go, uh, I'd go home once a day. Um, I'd go to like a grocery, I have a fridge in here and I, I was fine for lunch or whatever, but for dinner and then they'd leave the door. My, I'd sit in the hallway and I did these, uh, on Instagram, I did this thing called daily twin talk with my girls where I talk to them while they're, you know, 15 feet away in the doorway of my apartment while I'm eating dinner on the floor in the hallway for, and I did that for, uh, about 12 days. And then I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like at 14 days, should I just go home? So I was like, I don't know what to do. And I was, I didn't want to, like, I wasn't feeling at the beginning. I was really sick. Um, uh, and I didn't know what it was. And it, maybe it might have been the virus. I don't know. I had a, I never get headaches. I had a headache for like two weeks straight. Uh, but anyway, I texted my, my doctor and I have a really good relationship. And I text him and immediately he texted me back. And he's like, just come in tomorrow. I got the test. I'll test you. I was like, okay. So 9 a.m., I'm in his office and I got it on Instagram too. He jammed the thing down my nose and like, <laughs> Uh, and I got tested and he said it, the, and this was kind of like the same thing. I guess the, a lot of the hospitals were going through at this time. He said, look, I don't know how, when it'll come back. It could be two days. It could be between two and 10 days. So I said, all right, I'm just going to stay in the studio till I get the results. So, um, and I was like, two days was, was my two weeks in the studio, but I was like, I'm just going to play it safe and I'm going to stay till I get the results back. This makes sense to me now. Um, and if it takes up to 10 days, it's all right. I've been here 14 days anyway. So a couple days later, I got an email at like 9:49 five at night. I didn't even look. I woke up and I would have gone home. I woke up in the morning and I looked at, it, I was like, yes, I'm negative. Oh my gosh. And I ran home and that was 16 days of isolation before I got home to see my wow. family. Yeah. Well, I definitely hope you and your family stay safe throughout all this shit. I mean, it's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, that's, that's good to hear. Yeah, no, I, I saw some of the, uh, the twin talk and you got the wake up and goals. I mean, you're, you're, you're a very um, high energy dude. So um, it must have been especially difficult, you know, not being able to immediately, you know, hug your family when you got home and kind of keep your your home routine to what it was, um, yeah. you know, having to stave it off and just be you know, hostage in your studio. Um, I mean, worse things could have happened. I mean, it's, it's not, it doesn't, you know, it probably wasn't that, that terrible, but it certainly, certainly is pretty, pretty tough. I was just thinking how fortunate I was to have a place to, to, right. to go. I mean, where would I've gone if I, if I, if I didn't have the studio, I mean, most people don't have an extra space that they can crash in, you know, and, and if you're quarantining, you can't go over to a friend. It's not like I could say, Hey, can I crash on your couch? You know, it's like the whole point is you got to stay away from people. So yeah, I was, like, I was not going to be thrilled in, in, uh, staying in a hotel for, for two weeks or something. So, um, right. I did shower once in the two weeks. <laughs> it was one, one time I showered. That's good. It worked. I wasn't near anybody. So I guess it's all right. Made it. Well, that's great, man. Um, you just defended yourself. Yeah. It was just you. Just you and exactly. the chickens and goats that you thought you were sleeping with. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking back about this conversation that we had about, you know, photography and stuff. And 90% of it was not about the technical aspect of photography you know so much so often it's easy for us 
you know, and a lot of, and, and Mark, Daniel and I, we, we tend to like, you know, we're, we're really into gear, you know, geek we're always, you. oh, we geek out. We're such like, we're so bad with, with that stuff. And it's so much fun, you know, and like, you know, we're all trying out different lenses and like, we're, we're also like completely ridiculous because we love shooting manual rangefinder Leicas, which, you know, cool, totally, totally different thing, but it's, it's got a look, it's got a vibe, it's got a feel, whatever. Um, but it's interesting because like you, I, I need, you know, for so much of my portrait work, so much of my professional work, I need this, this auto focusing camera. And now with mirrorless and IAF and IBIS and all these other kind of crazy things, it's almost impossible. I remember when I, so I bought a Sony, I have an a seven R three. Um, and I, I just don't love it cause I don't love the color, whatever. I, I don't want to, I'm not bashing Sony. It's, it's incredible. I mean, the thing is absolutely spectacular. It does everything well, but, um, I remember I picked up a, a, a Canon DSLR just thinking like, maybe I'll just, you know, wait until something better comes along. And I, the thing was so ridiculously big and heavy and clunky <laughs> and it didn't have the electronic viewfinder. I'm like, fuck, I can't go back. I can't go back. So it's, it's refreshing to hear how it, how you've had such good results and, 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 and do you are, so you must be really happy with the EOS R and the color you and the skin tones. Like, is there anything yeah. that you don't like about it? And like, what lenses are you digging with that thing for portraiture? Oh my gosh. I, I think the lenses are the best, the best thing going. That's um, what I'm hearing. I mean, they're coming out with a new one too. And I told them, I said, get me that sucker. I'm an EOL. And I was like, I want that thing the minute it comes out. I mean, I, I, all the people that complained about the two card slots and all that stuff, I don't care. I'm a studio shooter. Things tethered. What am I, what am I, I don't, I don't care about that. Stuff. So I love it. Um, yeah. Skin tones seem good to me. I, I like what I'm getting at in the results. The thing that I compare it to is the five DSR. Um, which is what got me to Canon. They said, mm. I was shooting medium form, and they said, look, we got a 50 megapixel coming out. We want you to help bring it to market. Do you want to hear? And they handed it to me. And I was like, wow. And that's when I was like, this thing's fast and cool, and this works, and I'm going with it. Uh, and I love the look of that. So, so I'm excited to see what the new sensor and what the new camera will, will do. But I like the USR. I like everything about it. That My 5DSR got stolen. A guy walked into my studio telling me and my assistant that he was looking to set up a photo shoot and he walked into my closet and walked out with my camera during oh, the process. What? It was really weird. Um, yeah, but he, luckily he, he took a sip of water from the water cooler and the police came and, and got his DNA off of the cup that was in the garbage. We took, pulled the cup out of the garbage. They got the prints and his DNA off the cup and they caught the guy. It's unbelievable. I never got my camera back, but I got the insurance. Whatever. Oh, good. Um, Justice. But certain. I was like, this was the moment. I was like, okay, I got the insurance money. Uh, do I buy a five DSR again, or do I just stick with the with the EOSR? And I decided to just invest in the lens. The lenses are insane. So I've got um, my two newest ones, which are the ones that I'm using the most, which I love, is the eighty five. Uh, one two the RF eighty five one two DS and and um I waited for the DS to come out. I brought the eighty five one two to market with them. We launched it in I believe it was spring of last year. I think it was June of last year. Um, and then I knew that the the DS model was coming out, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna wait. And then that sucker came out. I grabbed it and I got it in December, so it's pretty new for me. And then I got the seventy to two hundred RF seventy to two hundred um, as well. And that thing is awesome. The the thing about this the EF seventy to two hundred, I was always like, it's so huge. Right at the two eight, I so I would always use the F four because they made an F four and they make it two eight, and I and I always liked the F four because it was just so much light. It was like half the weight of the of the two eight. Yeah, but the form factor on the um on the new one is shorter and it, it extends instead. So the form factor is a lot shorter and it's a lot smaller and the sharpness of the thing is unbelievable. I love, I love all the lens, the lenses that they're coming out with are crazy and they're so massive that the, even though the body's pretty small, the right. 85 is like, it's like, it's so like the, the glass is unbelievable coming out of Canon right now. 
Yeah. We've heard good things about that R5. So I think everyone's kind of anxiously anticipating it. I mean, I'm probably going to move to Canon uh, mirrorless, you know, for my kind of AF autofocusing rig. And I think that that's going to be the camera that'll be the decisive point. Because I had the EOS R for a short time and I didn't gel with it as much. I think it was also early days, like the firmware. It was the old firmware, yeah. The old firmware. It was really, it was a little buggy. Um, obviously, you know, Peter, you're in a more controlled environment. You know, you're, you know, you're, so yeah, anyway, so maybe it was easier um, for you in that respect. But um, yeah, it's interesting to to hear that, especially coming from shooting medium format and having that that look you know, which is, is so unique. Um, I miss that. I do miss that though. Yeah. I was just going to say, are you still using that uh, old medium format film gear every once in a while or? I've got it. I mean, it sits <laughs> in the drawer. Uh, or do you want to sell that? Film. Or do you want to sell the contact yeah. 645? <laughs> yeah, I know. People are always asked to buy it from me. I was like, I can't sell that. Uh, do, you, kind of, do you have like an alternate system, like let's say, you know, you're just buzzing around town on city bike or you're traveling around in Australia, wherever you are. Do you like, do you have like a little portable rig that you carry or are you oh, more just iPhone? Terrible. I'm just terrible. <laughs> no, I, I really used to, I was shooting so much in the studio that I was like, I'm just not gonna, I don't want to take pictures outside. Like I race sailboats and, and uh, that's my thing. So whenever right. I'm sailing, like sailors never, I don't think, have ever seen me hold a camera like they're always like we don't even know like you never have a camera in your hands you're a photographer what <laughs> yeah <laughs> which i think i don't think is great i mean i spent a lot of time in the early parts of my career hanging out with bruce weber and he always had a camera around he always was walking around he took pictures of everything and i always he always inspired me so i was like i gotta be more like bruce i gotta actually grab a camera and walk around with one well there's no, there's no requirement for that. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it look. It feels weird that I don't do it. Like, I feel like, like I don't do personal projects. I don't, uh, I don't get inspired to shoot new stuff. Like I'm doing the same thing. I feel, feel like, I mean, I love what I do. I'm inspired by what I do, but I feel like, you know, I should, I, I just always feel so rushed with so much other stuff that I have to do. I, and, and especially now, now we have time, like, right. And right. I still, it's been a month. It's April 17th, May, um, March 17th was the day that I got home. So it's been a month and I can't believe how time flew. Like I didn't get, I wanted to work on my, I was like, oh, I got a month. I'm going to perfect my portfolio. I'm going to go dig into some, like I have so many pictures that aren't in my portfolio on my website that are awesome that need to be on there. And I thought this is the month to do it. But I have not even gotten close to even, I haven't even opened up my Synology or looked in my archives like once this in the month. So maybe this, <laughs> maybe by May. You know, I don't, I don't do think, think that's a bad thing to be honest. Like I think that there's definitely like that kind of self-imposed pressure that we all have. Like we need to be productive. We need to be producing. This is, I'm going to do that project. I'm going to start this. I'm going to organize my backup. I'm going to redo my website. I'm going to, you know, whatever. I think it's totally, I think, I think you can say it's okay. You, you know, you can be okay with it. Like take the time off. Like you and a lot of us have been go, 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 go. Like no downtime. It's hard not having something filling every moment with work. But I think once we get back into it, because I find for me that the more shit that's going on in my life, I tend to be more productive. When there's less shit going on in my life, I can be much more of a lump. So yeah, me too. That's the way I think I'm feeling now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think it's I think it's perfectly natural, and I think it's actually okay. And like you, like you know, I've been doing like you know, doing a lot of mountain biking and just trying to kind of maybe not intentionally, but I have taken some time away from it, you know, so that I'm not just kind of like just recirculating a bunch of stuff. Um, maybe get back into it with fresher eyes, let's say. So. I like that. I yeah. like that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's a crazy thing, but um, it's, it's, you know, hopefully we'll come out of this and we'll have like even a new approach to what we're doing. You know, I mean, just, 
just even some of the little nuggets that you shared, and I won't, and I'm not minimizing some of the major nuggets that you've shared in this podcast. I mean, it's just the mentality, the ideology, the, the, the approach. I think that there's a universality to it. You know, it's like, I think that the way we are connecting um, in this format, you know, on Zoom, <laughs> Um, will only contribute to the kind of connections that I think will make us people once we kind of reintegrate ourselves back, you know, into each other's orbits in space. Because um, I I feel like during this time it's 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 almost made people connect even more than they have. You know, take that time to pick up the phone or reach out or send that email or zoom up with somebody. So. Who knows? I mean, I think people, I'm hoping that people are going to be desperately excited to get back in front of the camera, that that's going to be their number one priority. Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. But the <laughs> 200 millimeter stipulation. Exactly. Yeah. 200 is a little far. I think we, we should, could do 135 will do it. Yeah. Not even is good. I'm gonna, we should buy a stock in 135? Yeah, 135 <laughs> is far enough. We should literally buy every 135 lens stockpile them and then we can just rent them no yeah i just know because i've you know the canon lets me go which lens do you want i was like give me all i just did a bunch and i was like my distance to my subject at 135 is way too far yeah i can't yeah. do it but, but now it's gonna be just right yeah i had a when i first started shooting canon i switched from nikon to canon um i bought the 135 i think it was the f2 amazing lens and this was dslr days because i know that like there's 135s for canon now that are also amazing but it, i i felt the same way it was like too far to connect you know you're just like you need like a little megaphone to like you know connect with your subject i mean 85 is it, to me like that's like the perfect portrait lens you know for like headshot type stuff three quarter or whatever I love the separation of that. And I think that the, the distance is, is really manageable. I mean, 50 is nice, put you real close, but probably not ideal these, these days. I mean, even like a 35 millimeter portrait can work at some, in some way, you know, a little more environmental. Yeah. But, um, You're just bumming me out, man. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Getting bummed out. I'm just, ugh. Peter, yeah, did, did you get a, sorry. No, no, no. Right. Peter, did you get a chance to try the 50, the Canon 50? Yeah, I have it. It's supposed to be the sharpest one. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It's supposed to be? <laughs> it's supposed to be because I talked to the Canon guys. No, like the sharpest thing that they had, like so sharp. It's, on the sharpness tests, it blew away Zeiss, I heard. I, I just, Oh, my God. <laughs> we should pixel peep the shit out of that. But I don't know. I just That's what one of the Canon guys told me. So it's coming from Canon. But... But I was like, oh, I have that lens. I'll shoot it more often now. <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't care about sharpness. I never, right. never yeah. did. I, I don't, you know. Especially for really, portraits. I'm not that guy. Yeah. I'm not like, like if you look at all the, all the shots that Bruce ever took of me when I was modeling, it's everything. I mean, what's he shooting? A Pentax 6.7 and, you know, <laughs> this thing and he's hand holding. I mean, there's just not, you know, it's not happening. It's not sharp as a tack. <laughs> uh roll and a roly you know i was like mm. i was like i love all the pictures and they're all kind of soft and beautiful and, and right and stuff so i never worry about that so whenever and i have you know people that i coach that are like super technical i'm like i'm that don't ask me don't ask me that i'm not that guy i get the instagram people like well what's the blah 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 i was like i have no <laughs> idea i point the thing at the person i press the button it works it looks good right you know, i'm good <laughs> well for you, the, the, the cameras, the lighting, they're all tools, you know, you, you, you don't, you know, some people wank on that stuff. They're just like, Oh my God, it's got this many megapixels and mega jizzles and you know, all this other stuff. And they're so, they're so into every little spec and they drill down every spec. And like, I literally shut off. I'm like, ah, I don't give a shit. You yeah, know? And then you're like, uh, show me your work, please. <laughs> right. <I> got nothing. <laughs> yeah. You know, if the photos look beautiful, if the tones are there, if, 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 you know, if it has an organic look to it, I'm all in, you know, if it's like clinically sharp and like, you know, you can see every little nose hair, it's like, eh, I don't know if I want to see that. Some people's work is nice like that, but I, I don't concern <laughs> myself. You're, with it, you're you just know? being too damn nice, man. You, Peter, <laughs> Mr. President. Exactly. <laughs> Vote for Peter Hurley. Yeah. 
No, I, I, I think you. I think you got to find, you know, we talk about this all the time. You got to find what works best for you when inspired. You know, some people draw inspiration from uh, a lens, uh, camera, look, and some people want that um, crazy sharp, you know, crazy sharpness and contrast and some people like softer. So that's the beauty. You can find all different tools for uh, whatever you're going for. And sometimes you know, one, I, you walk out of, you walk out of your house one day with the lens. I know you don't Peter, but uh, <laughs> some people might walk out of their house with the camera and the lens and say, I'm in the mood for this one day. And the next day it's, you know, you're going on a job. It's a little different. You want, you want a, another lens and another body for a different look. But um, I sort of, cause we, we talk a lot about, especially during this time when there's not much else to do, but experiment with lenses and cameras that we have um, that you don't really get caught up in that. And it's sort of a little refreshing and a little inspiring to sort of take a step back and um, kind of see it more as connecting, two people connecting rather than... Collaboration. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, collaborating and creating a connection to your subject rather than creating it. Because right now, I, I, it's, it's been a while since I've had a subject that's not my kids or wife or dogs. Um, and so I feel the connection towards the camera at the moment in the lens, not my subject. I mean, yeah. my, fa my family. But uh, so it's, it's kind of unnerving to have gone so long without, <clears throat> without working, without photographing people that... Um, you're going a little crazy, my friend. I know, I am. I told you when I first got on here, I was like, yeah. my 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 five year old's just going off the walls, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and I try to get him to come in the basement. I'm like, I just, I just got my first uh, Roly, and um, I'm trying to like lure him with dessert, extra dessert down in the basement, set up my lights, take some portraits. Oh my god! And I'm getting him to help me develop film. He's looking at the timer, and oh, you know, that's cool. Yeah, like, little projects. Don't drink that. <laughs> don't I'm like, drink. I'm like, don't, don't Thanks, touch sir. it. Don't touch yeah. it. He always puts his hands in his mouth. I'm like, don't touch it. Oh. Yeah. Hey, Peter. Um, I know we got to go probably in a, in a minute or two here, but just just quickly, like, if you had to, let's say, I'm sure a lot of photographers contact you all day long. I'm sure. But like for a new photographer, let's say somebody who's just getting started that's taking portraits, what is like, what do you typically tell people when they say, hey, Peter, how do I take a portrait of somebody? What do, what do I do? Um, I'm sure you get asked that question quite a bit. I mean, you know, I just, yesterday I was on a Zoom with a friend and they were, and it was for a bunch of kids that were, uh, they were being homeschooled, but they, they uh, one of them was taking pictures. And she held the picture up on the screen and was like, how's this? What, what do you have? What do you have? You have any t and I was like, it's great. And I was like, that looks awesome. And it really did look good. I just was like, I just tell people, the more people you get in front of the camera, the more you can practice like your way of directing them. So, but this, this girl, I think it was a girl that shot it. Um, she already, the light was great. The expression was great that she had done con a black and white conversion on it. That was pretty good. I was like, Hey, you're, you're there. Right. You're messing with it. You know, um, the more experience you have. So, um, I mean, what's it, Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours to master yeah. something. I, I always say, you know, I've shot, I can't even get, I mean, 20 or 30,000 people. I don't know, maybe 30 or 40,000. I don't know how many people I shot, oh. but I don't feel like I mastered this thing. I don't feel yeah. even close. And I, That's and I've awesome. shot, spent way more than 10,000 hours at it. So yeah, it's where it's like, but it's a labor of love. Like you've got to, I mean, p photographers generally just love taking pictures. So, you know, just make the effort. I think the one thing that we do, we won't step out of our comfort zone sometimes just to ask people, or strangers or people that we don't know or whatever to, to, if we can photograph them. So go ask, you know, go do it. Yeah. Get somebody in front of your camera every, every day, even if it's a, your iPhone on the street, direct them a little bit or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you're trying to shoot portraits, you've got to get people in front of your camera, period. Yeah, that's great advice. And hopefully 
when things change and the world starts getting back to normal, we can start asking strangers on the street for those kinds of uh, yeah. connections. <laughs> yeah, right now. That's right. Yeah. The bumming out yeah. continues. Yeah, now, yeah. Now we just have to use a <laughs> megaphone to our neighbors. Hey, stick your head out. I want yeah. to take your portrait. No, it's fine. I don't care if you haven't showered in two weeks. Yeah. Mask on, yeah. mask on. Uh, put pants on, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, look, Peter, um, Thank you so much for joining us today, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. What an incredible treat just to be able to talk to you and, and say hi. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Yeah, yeah. and I'm glad you, you and your family are doing well. That's, that's good to hear. Thank you. I always like seeing your stuff in, the, in my feed, though. That house with the, after the rain was really cool. Oh, thanks, man. That, that was, that's literally like me standing in my driveway photographing my neighbor's house. That's cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so guys, I'm going to wrap this thing up here. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. If you've made it to this point, thank you even more. Um, it's such an incredible pleasure to be um, on a call with Peter Hurley. Um, the guy is just full of knowledge, full of love. Um, he really definitely has an approach that um, I think I, uh, countless people have have been able to really benefit from whether they're in front of his camera or they're photographers that have learned from him. I mean, I know that, that I've picked up numerous nuggets from you over the years following you. I've picked up nuggets even today in our conversation, all good stuff and great energy. Um, as always, make sure to follow Peter Hurley. You can follow Peter Hurley on the Instagram. It's at Peter Hurley. Easy enough. Peter underscore Hurley. Oh my God. Peter underscore. The underscore, you know, I mean, who even heard had, of an underscore growing up? There I was not an Peter underscore. Hurley. <laughs> I had Peter Hurley, but I couldn't get Peter Hurley on Twitter. I had Peter underscore Hurley on Twitter. Oh. Back then, Twitter was bigger than Instagram. So everybody said you had to be the same on both. So right. one, one of my friends told me to do it. So I got rid of Peter Hurley and I put Peter underscore Hurley and that was just dumb. Well, you know what? I, I don't think it's hurt you a bit, my friend. And everyone <laughs> jump out to Peter underscore Hurley um, on Instagram and look at his work and check out his website and his whole vibe and his mentality and sign up for a workshop and do all these things. Support this guy. He's doing some amazing stuff. Uh, while you're at it, uh, please subscribe to this podcast. You can listen to it wherever podcasts are being played. You can just follow the link in the description. You can just continue to watch this if you guys are watching it on YouTube because it's riveting um, and subscribe to my YouTube as well. So uh, that's it for now, guys. Thanks so much. And we'll see you soon.